and um, uh, worked uh, at various branches of the military for several years, correct? I don't know exactly how Eleven long. Years. Eleven years. Thank you for your service. Um, and uh, so this is Gov 2.0 LA. This is our fourth year. Um, if you're following us on Twitter, the hashtag is Gov 2.0 LA. You can ask questions of the speakers and or participate. Um, and Graham, just hold the microphone sort of Will do. towards the front. Thank you. Simultaneously, my uh, Barack Obama teleprompter and my Marco Rubio water bottle. <laughs> so I'm apolitical. <laughs> yeah. Well, Clint Eastwood was an outlier. All right. So um, my name is Graham Plaster. I'm the CEO of the Intelligence Community LLC, and I'll talk a little bit about what my company's doing and. But uh, first, just a word of introduction about myself. Uh, I just wrapped up 11 years active duty in the, in the Navy, graduated from the Naval Academy in 2002. I am a digital native, although I'm not a programmer. The extent of my programming skills is a little bit of QBasic in high school. And uh, then I went off to the Naval Academy, became an English major at an engineering school. So that, made, that gave me a, a BS in English. <laughs> but I've always been fascinated by uh, the human side of engagement with technology. And um, what happened is after about uh, seven years as a surface warfare officer, which is the ship drivers of the Navy, I took an academic interest in what was happening with, um, with literature in the Middle East, especially in Iran. And so it was about 2007 that I started working on a master's degree, kind of focusing on what was going on with social media, uh, with its roots in Iran, going back to the, the poetry heritage, evolving to journalism and free poetry, and then microblogging, and then uh, what we saw happening with the Green Movement. And I got picked up in a special program in the Navy called the Foreign Area Officer Program. They sent me off to learn a little bit of Arabic, which turned out to not be my strong suit, but then uh, I caught the interest of some senior level intelligence types uh, and became kind of a back channel advisor to some things that were happening. Since I've gotten out of the active duty, I'm still uh, involved with the military as a reservist, and um, so my CEO role with uh, this company is, it, we're still in the startup mode, you know, we've, still, we've been going as an organization for, um, as, as a company for about a year and a half, and the founder, uh, John Goodnose in the back, and I took over as CEO just about four months ago. So a lot of what I'm pitching to you today is kind of vision, big vision for where we're going with it, and uh, a little bit of history about you know, how we evolved to where we are, and also some deep thoughts by Graham Plaster on the internet and uh, you know, culture and, and stuff like that. All right, so four kind of overarching questions. Just to give you some background, because I know the audience that's watching this uh, isn't necessarily gonna know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna talk about the US intelligence community, what that actually means, what the monikers, the intelligence community and the IC kind of actually refer to in common usage now, post 9-11. Uh, the vision and values of my company, and then uh, trends and market forces I think are pretty interesting to discuss in light of that. So the US intelligence community, in, in case you already know, is a coalition of 17 agencies, uh, both focused um, internationally and domestically. And uh, they have their own seal, they have their own focus. And it was 16 agencies after 9-11, they, they stood up the, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and which has the administrative responsibility of overseeing all of the intelligence agencies. And so each one of these agencies you see uh, listed here have their own, of course, large bureaucratic structure. And all of them work together, ideally, to uh, provide recommendations for senior decision makers in the government for what we're gonna do. So, I think, th I think there was a recollection and a, um, a realization after 9-11 that, uh, especially in the 9-11 Commission report, uh, if you've had a chance to look at that, that they're just, uh, although a lot of the intelligence was there to potentially prevent 9-11, 
there wasn't the kind of collaboration that we needed. So there, wa there were what we call silos of information. There was redundancy of collection of information. There wasn't the sharing of information that we needed across the different agencies and organizations. Uh, a lot of money was being spent redundantly to collect that kind of information. And so what we see happening in social media as far as cultivating a new culture of sharing, of course, there's, there's a lot to be gained in the intelligence community from, from that and in incorporating that. And I know, Amy, with everything you did with Intellipedia, really important you know, for moving forward in that. Um, so you know, what we're doing with, uh, with our company is a little different because it's, it's a private company. I'm a veteran. It's a veteran-owned U.S.-based company. And we're, we're kind of focusing on the larger audience of the intelligence community. So how is the intelligence community in the IC, how is that term kind of thrown around in the vernacular? Well, after 9-11, as you can imagine, there was a lot of money spent on um, counterterrorism in every organization you can imagine, domestically, internationally, the U.S., our allies, and other countries. Um, there was sprawl. The, the Washington Post, two years ago, did a big expose on the amount of spending that was going on. Uh, they called it Top Secret America. It's a decent read. Um, and then, as I have at the bottom of this slide, CIA Director Leon Panetta, he says, you know, uh, particularly with these deficits that we're facing, we're going to have to hit a wall sometime. I want to be prepared for that, and I think that the intelligence, everyone in intelligence ought to be doing that. So, you know, he had, he had some foresight. Now, we're, you know, we're a few years later, and we're doing it. We're having, we hit the wall, and we're starting to see the, the sequester and the furloughs and the things that are going to force us to, um, to make some changes. But the intelligence community isn't just the federal organizations. It's also, in kind of uh, a slang sense, it also incorporates people that are just interested in it or have worked as translators in service to it in the cottage industries around counterterrorism, um, translation, geopolitical analysis, uh, embassy work, you know, diplomacy. All of that kind of folds under the umbrella of the intelligence community. And so if you just use the baseline of the number of clearances out there that the government has issued, and this includes government uh, workers and private contractors to get clearances, we have uh, 4 million clearances out there, 4.9 4 million. And, uh, and you see some of the numbers there as far as the increases that we're seeing. There's a lot of money involved in that. So our company evolved Well, these numbers come from a 2010 study from Washington Post. So this is just a snapshot in time, two years ago. Um, as far as what I see, what the companies are doing, the organizations and, the, and the, the private companies are doing, I can talk about that when we talk about what's happening on LinkedIn and our website. Um, I certainly see trends for what, you know, what's happening with them. Uh, I see, um, other than the innovative uh, approaches used at DIA, and, and General Flynn, who's the director of DIA, is, is trying to forge ahead and do some really innovative things. Um, and CIA obviously has done some innovative things uh, with uh, NQTEL. But uh, what I generally see is a lot of trepidation on the part of the government and the especially the military and intelligence when it comes to things like social media because there's so many vulnerabilities involved. So as a culture, people generally uh, you know, shy away from really you know, forging ahead and being on the cutting edge of, of using those things because Oftentimes they have proprietary platforms at work that they have to spend most of their hours learning how to use. And when they come home at the end of the day, they might get on Facebook a little bit, might get on Twitter a little bit, but you know they're going to try to minimize their profile a little bit. So they're kind of late adopters, some of them. And so what we're going to see with these huge numbers as far as what's currently on the market, and then we'll talk about the market forces and what's going on with um, the downsizing of the government uh, a little bit. And, and, and you'll see that there's a, there's a flow of, of expertise and money uh, into these social networks, especially LinkedIn, because it's a professional network. And, um, and I think that we, we are poised to see something really interesting happen on LinkedIn especially. 
So we're a veteran-owned U.S.-based company that manages two uh, online communities the, for military government and business intelligence. Business intelligence is something we could talk about a little bit in Q&A. Uh, it does relate to government and military intelligence when you talk about providing geopolitical analysis to Coke or Pepsi if they want to put their headquarters, you know, in some African location and they want to have some sort of readout on you know, cost-benefit analysis, then there, ha there are some similarities between a government analytical report and a business analytical report. Uh, of course, they diverge when it comes to other kinds of other aspects of you know, economical uh, advice. Uh, so we manage two things. The LinkedIn group called the Intelligence Community. John started in 2008. He's a private investigator. He said, how am I going to network for my next job? This, that's the kind of the common question. Uh, John, could you just raise your hand? So that's John Goodnow. And so he, he was a, a power end user for LinkedIn uh, in 2008. He, he started this group. He started moderating the group. He probably didn't have as much of an understanding at the time for how large the intelligence community is or has become. Uh, and so people started flocking to the group. He put in a lot of work on the front end, making it a quality community, creating subgroups and all that. And um, some pretty high profile people started joining, networking with him. And uh, two years ago, uh, because I'm on the board of directors for the Foreign Area Officer Association, I'll talk about that at the end, uh, and I do their social media. I reached out to him, assuming he was in D.C., and I said, hey, John, why don't we get together for coffee, because you run this large LinkedIn group called the Intelligence Community. Foreign Area Officers fit under that umbrella. How about we, you know, talk about how we can work together? And he said, great, let's talk, but I'm in Arizona. Uh, so we got on the phone, we hit it off, uh, over the course of time, we forged a partnership and turned a LinkedIn group into a company. Brought on another partner, launched a website, and basically with kind of a little bit of an idealistic view of let's provide um, the kind of structure, not necessarily for sharing secrets or information, it's all unclassified, but the kind of structure that can create the relationships that might have prevented a 9-11. So we you know, can introduce the person that organization X to agency Y through LinkedIn or through a website. And it's global and it's virtual. And then that private conversation can happen through another channel. So uh, you know, our focus really is on community rather than content. Although a lot of people you know, clamor to our community and say, where's the content? Well, it's user generated. So, and I'll talk about that with our internship program and what we're doing to generate some really interesting, unique content, especially in light of what happened in Boston. Here's some snapshots of our most recent numbers this week. So we currently have 29,000 members on LinkedIn in our group. Uh, comments last week's 119 is very low, actually, because I posted a discussion thread as soon as the Boston bombings happened, and that has currently 223 comments on it. And these are all people that have some sort of analytical skill level. It might be like, they might be in like a counterterrorism program at a university, all the way up to a PhD in uh, Chechnyan geopolitics. So we've got some really interesting stuff going on on there. It's, it's, if you know about LinkedIn, this is actually an open group. That doesn't mean everybody can join. It just means everything's indexed and viewable on Google uh, if you search for it. Uh, but you still have to be vetted and approved to join. And then every discussion thread is vetted also. And I use a really unique uh, criteria for getting onto our discussion board. So uh, people have to read the group rules to figure that out, and so it makes it really easy for me as a moderator to weed people out who haven't read this, the group rules, because it requires a hu human interaction to fix. You have to read. So it's, it's great, because I can have this high volume of people on, on the group, and, uh, and as a moderator, you know, I can very quickly weed out the people that are not in compliance with the group rules. Some of them get a little frustrated at that. I just say, obviously, you have not read the group rules. Okay, but it's, the demographics are interesting. When you look at the seniors, the people that claim to be in a senior position, um, is about, I think, 9,000 people right now. Uh, it roughly corresponds, actually fairly closely corresponds to this, the number of people that are in the Washington, uh, Annapolis Junction area. So 32% senior, supposedly, 15% entry level. And then a lot of them are in either IT, it's about, I think, 15 to 20 percent, or they're in 
So defense in space, which is kind of a really rough category, I think that LinkedIn uses. Um, and then location is heavily in the, the Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. As you can see, that's a natural outgrowth of all the spending that happened nine after 9-11 with uh, the intelligence community and national security sprawl across that region. But if you were to compare us to some of the other uh, intelligence-related nonprofit associations, and I'll just pick INSA, for example. It's the Intelligence and uh, um, Security Alliance, I think. And INSA uh, has their physical focus on the, the national capital region around DC. And we have, uh, by comparison, uh, 30, you know, 30 to 35 percent of our constituents are in that area. And then the majority are sprawled all over the world. And so uh, compared to other intelligence nonprofits and associations, we actually have a really unique kind of global uh, reach. So that's the industry spreads. This is what our website currently looks like. It's built off of a Ning platform. If you're familiar with Ning, it allows you to customize like a social website. Very low uh, cost for us. We just launched it a year ago and we have about 2,000 members. We ha we've had 277 blog posts, um, and um, I'm using uh, a really robust internship program to start to create an alternative to the LinkedIn group, and I'm using a freemium model, so you have the large free network on LinkedIn, which will always be much, much larger than our website, and constantly uh, LinkedIn allows me to message the uh, LinkedIn group on a weekly basis and drive traffic to the website. And then I encourage all of our interns who are ranged, like I said, anywhere between college students to, you know, PhDs with multiple languages and work for the U USAID and UN. And they are um, providing rich content for the website. And, um, and we're going to be conducting interviews with um, industry leaders and posting those to the website, all with the intention of building relational bridges in the community and also um, cre creating a conduit between the uh, established uh, government agencies and the de facto live global intelligence community. So we, you know, we advertise at every turn that we're totally unclassified, open source, so you know, we never want to tempt people to share anything, any industry knowledge that would get them in trouble. And so we actually post on our website all the different social media policies of the intelligence community organizations that we have. So our vision, our, our grand vision, is to become a virtual global volunteer intelligence agency. So, and in that capacity, and this is disruptive because it's kind of positioned between a couple different industries out there for the intelligence community. One is all of the nonprofit associations, and, and there is, currently there's an association of intelligence associations. It's called ICANN. It's got 37 intelligence associations that are members of ICANN. And, uh, and I think pretty much all of them, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them are 501c3s, so they're nonprofits. And they, they have a focus of building community across the intelligence communities. A lot of them are focused on kind of alumni type networks or uh, retirees. But oftentimes those types of leaders have uh, an interest in uh, providing mentorship to the next generation in their field. So, so we're trying to work alongside those guys and provide kind of an umbrella for them because I've, I've attended some of the ICANN meetings and I know some of those guys personally. And there's a sense that we should be having more members. Why aren't people coming to our live events? Why aren't people subscribing to our journals? And so, the, you know, they're facing certain kind of uh, evolutionary challenges as they're adapting to the new environment. Meanwhile, uh, everybody is flocking to LinkedIn because whether you got furloughed and you're looking for a new job or you're, you're in a brand new shiny uh, counterintelligence degree program at a university that's supposed to give you a great job out of the door but you don't have a security clearance so you're trying to knock on doors trying to figure out where you can get hired. Um, there is a, a strong demand signal to join our LinkedIn group. Um, so as a virtual global volunteer intelligence agency, we want to rapidly crowdsource analytic products for the U.S. and allies. And we want to create some job mobility and mentorship tools. Uh, we want to, to create business-to-business -business opportunities for collaboration. We look at the government contracting process, and there's a lot of small businesses 
you know, one to ten man uh, or woman shops that uh, want to get in on contracts. They, you know, they're just kind of new to the process, and so we create a forum to do stuff like that. Uh, virtualization increased collaboration for the nonprofit associations that I just mentioned. A publishing house, and I'll talk about that in a minute. A think tank incubator, and uh, we'll actually do some live events eventually, and uh, webinars. So I'll jump ahead for a second. The internship program that we started within the first month and a half of us launching it, we had 50 people apply to it. And I would say 99% of them highly qualified got accepted in the program. And I have no limit on how many interns we bring into the program. We're going to be breaking the interns into two categories, liaisons and analysts. And if you're an analyst, you'll be asked to provide quality thought leadership on the LinkedIn group or the website. And you'll be broken into analytic teams and there'll be team leadership. So you have the opportunity to network with somebody who might be a little advanced in the career you know, somebody who might be, maybe has worked for a contracting company or an agency, and you'll, be, you'll have the opportunity to be evaluated based on your thought leadership. It doesn't have to be much. It's actually very low commitment. It doesn't require any travel. These guys, I've got interns that currently lo are located in Afghanistan and uh, Australia. And uh, one of the things I do with the interns is I get them on a um, conference call and I run them through these values. Because the way I see it, any social network, um, including the intelligence community or including even NASA, which I think is really interesting because it really naturally self-selects a really intelligent crowd. The kind of people set, you know, that come to your group are going to be mostly civil. Um, so even with uh, a group of uh, supposedly intelligent people that kind of self-select civil people, you're still going to have the Godwin's Law, you know, where as the comments go down, you know, they're going to the probability that someone's going to draw a comparison to Hitler is going to just <laughs> approach <laughs> absolutely. And so, you know, what do you do? So I, I personally, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I, I really feel like there's a lot of responsibility with anybody who governs protocols for an organization. You know, whether you're determining what platforms work on a website or what the group rules are for a LinkedIn group or, you know, who gets to join, who doesn't get to join. Those, those protocols that you establish are tantamount to writing the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for your group. And the higher up you go with technology, with the people that are determining the protocols, the more important it is with what they're doing. And I know uh, Pete talked earlier today about how some people are uh, opposed to creating any kind of bias in the system. But I really kind of feel like anybody who's a designer of any system is creating a bias of some sort. You know, you're creating a protocol. And so th these are the, some of the protocols that I want to establish with people that are interns with our organization. This is the tone that I want to set as we try to manage a large group. If I were to leave it unmanaged, as, as John experienced for several years, he managed it, but, you know, we, we started to formalize what is expected of this group, and so I've articulated strategically. You know, we want a professional tone. If you're partisan, if you're... Uh, if you're emotional, you're probably going to get deleted. And I've applied it to myself. I posted something, posted, I think, two different things that somebody said, eh, I probably shouldn't have posted that. So I deleted it, because not because I felt like it was inappropriate, because somebody else did. And so we maintain a very high standard. So these are the kind of the three um, things. And I would like to approach it kind of almost in a sense that, you know, in this new era of information uh, where someone who is an intelligence analyst or, you know, a thought leader has a responsibility almost like a physician and should kind of uh, ascribe to like a Hippocratic Oath to do the highest good with that information, you know, to, to do the highest good with that intelligence. That, that would be a great thing, I think. So these three core values is what I uh, try to inculcate into the um, uh, interns. One is the wisdom part because when you're de dealing with mountains and, and uh, piles of big data, uh, whether it's bank accounts or medical records, uh, I, I think it's best to insert the moral component and try to seek the highest, do the highest good with it. And uh, so I say, you know, you have to have more than intelligence. You have to have wisdom. And then the second one is more of a kind of a tactical thing. The care and the curation comes, you know, the curation, of course, is a buzzword in social media to curate a great website, you know, pull from the best sources, weed out the, the good from the bad and have a great blog or, you know, a great feed. 
that's the skill of, of a great intelligence analyst. So when you have a, a pile of hay and you say find the needle and they find the needle and they get rid of the hay and they say here's the needle to a senior decision maker, whether it's the president or a senior military decision maker, then that's a, a great skill to have. So it's a tactical skill that we want to cultivate. And also when it comes to perspective, and this is where the, the word care comes in, and we have the eagle in our logo, it's the idea of from a strategic perspective, you have the big picture, but the eagle is also able to drill down and have a really fine tooth uh, you know, picture of you know, the rabbit running along the ground. So it's being able to, to zoom out and zoom in very rapidly, have the big picture and this you know, fine tooth picture, because what happens is people get myopic. You know, they focus on one thing and they miss everything else, or um, as we'll talk about later, uh, you know, there's the signal to noise, noise ratio is really uh, unbearable. So you know all of the all the uh, scanner chat comes in and clouds everything out. So uh, integrity is the last thing. You know, let's just assume that everything eventually will be known to everybody and there is no privacy. Um, how would you act? And also, let's assume that eventually everybody in the intelligence community is going to want to get in a security clearance. How would you act? So integrity is absolutely uh, essential to operate in this environment where we're in constantly increasing transparency. So I already covered a couple of these, but the trends and market forces that are affecting our growth and our strategic uh, direction. We're seeing uh, the nonprofit associations that have traditionally been the gathering places for those in the intelligence community to come share industry knowledge network for the next job. They're tied to geographic locations. They are, you know, they're struggling to adapt to the new environment of social media. We're coming alongside them, helping them out. Uh, programs and companies are struggling for government contracts. So where are they going to turn to try to win the government contracts and a network to try, try to get in that space? Getting on LinkedIn is natural for that um, because, link the you know, the um, the net worth of an individual on LinkedIn is five times that of a Facebook user or a Twitter user. Uh, newly trained and retired national security professionals are between jobs uh, or about to break in a national security job. There's just so many people in that space right now who are trying to get a clearance or, or just got laid off and trying to get a new job. Yeah, and we're trying to create that sense of comfort not to share anything that would be, you know, detrimental to national security, but to network for professional purposes so they can get in the door. And so, and, and I'll talk about the, a little bit more about the internship program, how we're going to help people to do that. And then, um, you know, the odd simultaneous push for government transparency and at the same time information security. Uh, it's a little bit schizophrenic sometimes and uh, also the you know, maybe you're not all feeling it, but there is a there is a demand for social media savvy. It's kind of <laughs> slowly percolating. <laughs> well, maybe not by your standards, but there is a sliding scale on that. You know, it, I think you could probably do a great benefit to the rest of the public by ma making sure that you create a, a relational bridge with people that want to be thought of as good at social media. You know, I think uh, we need to basically uh, cultivate community with humility and say, look, you're not the same kind of expert as this. I, I just read a great article, I think it was Mashable, about seven, seven different types of social media experts. And it just kind of laid out all the different kind of backgrounds that people that are claiming to be social media experts are coming from. Well, and it, it's, you know, it, you really, like in calling myself a doctor, and I think we talked about that, John, yesterday with uh, in private investigators, you know, there's different brands, right? It, I'm, if I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I don't want to be your ER doctor or, or vice versa, you know? And uh, so social media expert, we're still kind of discovering what that might look like, but the different, you know, variations of that are going to be necessarily plugged into different roles. So not, you know, Square peg doesn't fit in round hole necessarily. Yeah. 
Yeah. Copy, yeah, whatever, whatever copy. I'll tweet it out. Yeah, I think so, and I think um, I think the reality is, and I tried to paint that picture in the beginning. I didn't do a good enough job, but there's the U.S. intelligence community, which is a lot of people who will not be using social media anytime soon. I mean, I think about anybody doing any kind of clandestine work or whatever, and they have a, a you know explicit policy: you know, do not engage in social media. Now, that's the current environment we're in for them. Now, that's going to continue to evolve over time. Uh, and we can talk about how maybe it should evolve. We can discuss in our forums on LinkedIn how we think it should evolve. You know, it's a good place to do that. We started those conversations. Um, but really, the, the reality of the people that are in our space right now are the job seekers, the retirees, the senior leaders who are using social media as a PR platform, um, the people who own their own company and have a product to sell to the intelligence community, um, the IT professionals who aren't really concerned about getting caught for what they do because they're just like coders or whatever, you know. So there's, it's it's skewed. Like the community that we represent is skewed from the federal intelligence community. So, yeah, there's probably um, you know a movement afoot for more and more people. And we look at like General Flynn, who's a mentor and a friend of mine, as the director of DIA, and uh, and he had asked me to be his aide at DIA a couple of years ago, which I wasn't able to do, but. Uh, I continue to maintain correspondence with him and provide him some, you know, tidbits here and there, and uh, and he has a, a LinkedIn profile, but so does Adel Stavridis, who's you know UConn, um, and uh, s those guys typically lean on somebody like myself to come in and say, okay, run my LinkedIn page for me, if you, you know, and I'm just going to use it for PR releases, um, so. It Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the functions that we can serve is to demo new technologies and new companies. That's why I want to do the interview format and do it really in a big way. Uh, I would like to, over the next couple of years, uh, bring on board uh, several thousand interns and have them all running simultaneously through the program and be able to um, task out to a group of them, say, I need, you know, I need 30 China analysts located all around the world to produce a book in a week on a particular issue that's hot. Um, or I need a couple of my liaisons to reach out to industry leaders in uh, CIA, DIA, FBI, and do interviews with people on this particular topic and post it to the website. And then I need another intern to collate all that data and provide kind of an executive summary. So we'll have the, the manpower and the woman power to do that. Um, more broadly and specifically, kind of coming full circle to what I said about wisdom, I'm going to kind of go Jack Handy deep thoughts on you and share some of the things that I think about. Um, and I, I pose a lot of them as kind of um, relationships between uh, opposites or opposing forces. Convergence versus curation. Um, so with convergence, we see in a lot of industries, academic disciplines, media formats, we see things blending together. So an example is the combatant commands. In the military, we have regions, European Command, Central Command, Northern Command, Southern Command. But if you are uh, an intelligence specialist and you, you for your whole career, you've been providing uh, analysis on Iran or on 
you know, Chechnya or something like that. And then you find out that NORTHCOM, which is, you know, the United States and Canada, suddenly has Chechnyan influence. Well, you know, then there is a seam between NORTHCOM and your area of specialization. So the COCOMs, there's some, some academic debate on whether or not we should do away with COCOMs or redefine the lines, you know, gerrymander them a little bit and figure out, like, for instance, that uh, Israel is not in CENTCOM, it's in UCOM. So, go figure. But with uh, the academic disciplines, when I got my master's degree, I got a master's in humanities because I wanted to get a blend of history, poli sci, English, I, you know, and then you turn around and try to market that for a job, and they're like, well, what's a master's in humanities? You know, it's not a specialist. But there, the reality of the world we live in, especially with regard to social media, is that everything's blending. And uh, for that reason, we value people that can stand in the gap between two industries or groups. We value liaisons. We value translators, linguists, you know, not just for languages, but for cultures, for, you know, people that are able to go back and forth between two different groups. Um, so that's, that's where convergence actually puts a certain kind of emphasis, a new emphasis, I think, uh, in our, uh, in our, context. And then curation is kind of on the other end because, because we've got so many mountains of data that we're dealing with, especially as intelligence analysts and as specialists, you know, it's so important to be really good at picking out the good from the bad, which means you've got to be really knowledgeable on a specific thing to be able to do that. So the, the art and the science of curation and, and pulling together the good out of the bad is sometimes requires a different skill set from being the person who can stand in the gap between organizations, and that's why our internship program is broken into those two different categories of liaisons, the people that help solve the convergence issue, and analysts who like to drill down and curate the good information from the bad information. And forms of communication is interesting also because with uh, the convergence of the different types of forms of communication, we looked at the, the dissolution of print media kind of evolving into um, you know, social media, and, you know, I, I had a conversation with a senior fellow at an association, an intelligence association recently, and um, she said, you know, maybe you should be talking to, like, AOL Defense. They might be interested in buying you guys out or something like that, because they are a, a media outlet, and they look at disseminating information, you know, and they're kind of one step between, you know, the Wall Street Journal, News, you know, international news, and then evolve to uh, an online syndicate, evolves to a LinkedIn group that does a decent job at getting the word out through our internship program. Um, content versus community. So, you know, we hear that content is king, community is king. Which one is king? Well, they're both king. I mean, both of them are important, right? The, if you have a, a great content website with no community, uh, we're, you know, then you have the Google syndrome. Let me show you how to Google that. You know, you can go and use it as a library for information, and you, it'll be a great resource, right? If you have just community um, and nothing to talk about, the community is probably going to die in the vine. So you have to have some of both, right? And w we have rich con content and community. So uh, candor versus transparency. You know, there's a huge push to, um, to have transparency in government. And the way I see it from inside the Beltway is that it creates a lot of... Um, uh, difficult demands on us to perform, you know, FOIA requests and different kinds of things. Not bad, I'm just saying, but they're difficult sometimes. And um, so it, then it can cost money and things like that. So transparency is, is a great thing to value. And uh, in, in an ideal world, you know, we have Julian Assange, we've got Mark Zuckerberg heralding transparency as, a, you know, this incredible value that we want to protect. And I, I would submit that when it comes to intelligence and um, uh, that candor is maybe a little bit more fine-tuned way to think about it. Instead of sharing all information with everybody, you know, trying to teach people to have the, the skill set to, to speak truth to power and to share the right information with the right person at the right time, then that's candor. And that's what any private company should value from its executive team and what the government should value also from its uh, advisors. And so we want to cultivate that. I think the reality is that 
uh, when it comes to social media, and especially with our LinkedIn group, I think of it as kind of a virtual embassy party. So if you were an attache at a foreign embassy, and the attache from Russia and China and Iran, and everybody was there, and you're all shaking hands, making nice, and you know, checking each other out, see what's going on. It's, uh, it's kind of the world we live in. So all the censorship, self-censorship, really has to take place inside. You know, keep your cards close to your chest and everything. And you're in the same building together. You're there, you're at the same party. But that's the social media environment that we're in. It's kind of like a virtual embassy party. Question. Yep. How does that play out when an individual uh, untrained? Well, I think the glut of information is part of our defense. <coughs> we can talk about that. But, you know, obviously the technologists are working on big data mining so that they can solve that problem. But I want to use that problem to our advantage and say, look, there's so much data out there. Maybe as intelligence analysts, we can think of ourselves more like PR firms. And instead of saying, uh, let's keep them from finding the needle in the haystack, let's just pile more hay on top and say that needle looks like a piece of hay to me. You know, it's 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 more like political spin. Personalized spin. Yeah, exactly. So that's one one approach uh, or posture, I would call it. Uh, it's it's not going to be well received, obviously, by you know people in you know the organization necessarily. But it's it's kind of a jamming approach, uh, in a sense, to a public appearance for for information that's coming out. Um, then, uh, what? Can intelligence learn from journalism, public relations? Just covered it. Uh, why social media is about images and links. You guys hit this one hard today. It's so so good. Because um, a picture says a thousand words. But I lean on a certain French um, philosopher from 1979, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard. He wrote a book called The Postmodern Condition. And he said that technology naturally truncates language. And so this is especially true when you look at what Twitter has done, you know, cutting us off at a certain number of characters. <laughs> Five minutes. Um, so I'll rush on ahead. Uh, so this is just an interesting aside. This is a map of the Persian blogosphere from 2008. Um, what, you know, one of the things I focused on in my master's was looking at what exactly was happening in this space. And the Berkman Center for Internet Democracy was studying it too. And um, they were looking at how these blogs were talking to each other, how many of them were Persian poetry, and you know, a lot of them were secular expatriate related. This is all based on the meta tags and how how close they are relationally has to do with like how many cross references they have and stuff. And I think it would be really interesting to do that kind of analysis with different kinds of social networks like the intelligence community. I've got a couple of models in mind uh, to do that. Um, talked about our internship program. And we currently have two sponsors who came on board recently, DoD Intel Jobs and ClearJobs.net, uh, great partners. And then Stratfor is one of our affiliates, Five Dimensions Consultants, Wikistrat and TI Data. So we just want to thank them. Uh, I mentioned I'm on the board of directors for the Foreign Air Officer Association. So if you find yourself in Washington, D.C. this week and want to go to a black tie event, I'm inviting you. <laughs> and the keynote speaker is uh, Mr. David Shedd. He's the DIA Deputy Director. And then this is a book that I helped write and edit. Um, Tom Brokaw liked it. And it's been on the LA Times bestseller list. And uh, all proceeds go to veteran nonprofits. That's it. Questions?